The Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came to and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Lord, bless us as we seek to walk in your ways. Amen. So I come back from vacation to the divorce text. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, probably one of the pastor's least favorites of all. Um, and... Oh, there's so much going on today that it's really, it's really hard to cover all the bases. So we, we, we get the same text every three years. We've got some time to get through it all. Um, but uh, you know, what struck me today is like, welcome to Culture War Sunday. We find in both our texts and our society the question of what should our norms be? In the text, we have the separation of man into man and woman and the establishment of marriage. In Mark, we have Jesus quoting Genesis and the importance of maintaining the marriage relationship. And then we begin our journey into the letter to the Hebrews, where we find a Christology that's an understanding of Christ that's a little different than the portrayal of Christ we encounter in the Gospels. This is the Christ who is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. We have four Gospels for a reason. It's kind of each of us takes us to a different viewpoint, and we have the same thing in Hebrews and Philippians, and so we're beginning a journey through Hebrews that today I will totally ignore, um, <laughs> into a little different perspective of, of Christ, but I invite you to, to pay attention as we go. So in our country, we have the disasters of Her Hurricane Helene and the goodness and the support given to people in that area. And we also have politicians trying to make political statements about who cares more for the people in the path of the hurricane. And Tuesday, we had the debate between the vice presidential candidates, which was much more civil than the first debate between the presidential candidates. But if you watch the whole thing, you saw different understandings of what should be our norms in society different understandings, uh, especially about how families should be supported, how people should be supported. And all through this, my husband and I are driving through Montana, and we spent a week working our way around Glacier National Park and then home via a detour through southern Idaho and, and back on I-84 
through the Columbia Gorge. And by the way, I thought Southern Idaho was forested. I didn't know it was high desert. Yeah. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> kind of sometimes have to go there. <laughs> uh, anyway, we saw both the majesty of this world that God created and also varying perspectives on how people live together in it. I remember one morning sitting in the breakfast room of a hotel in Boise and on the big screen TV was a station that I had never watched. Now the sound's not on, but it was clear from the news feed that the interpretation of world events being presented was radically different than my own perspective. And I'm really grateful for that experience because it helps me understand how we get to different places and how we think about things. And it makes me think about some of the comments I heard away, or along the way about fear for the future and, and what's, what all is gonna happen. And into all of this, we have a God who responds in Christ Jesus with power and grace and hope and with blessing the little children who are the most vulnerable of us. So today we go back to the beginning, to the creation of humanity. Now this is the second creation story in Genesis. The first one reads simply, so God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them. And in this second account we have more detail. So you, I'm sure all of you have lived long enough to hear this is interpreted as God created male and female in the beginning. So see, there's only two genders. And today I'm not focusing on that. Today I'm gonna to focus more about how God created humankind to be in relationship from the very beginning and to be helpers and partners for each other. So God created the first human, Ha-Adam, Ha meaning the Adam, uh, God the human, out of the dirt, Ha-Adama. And we don't yet, we have, we don't yet have any references to gender. The references to gender come when God declares that it's not good for this dirt person to be alone. All the animals and the creatures of the earth are not an adequate partner for the human, although dogs and cats might come close. <laughs> so God causes the human to fall into a deep sleep and forms a new creature from the side of the human. And now we have the Adam saying that this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and this one will be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. So even before we have mothers and fathers, we have deep partnerships established. And as society is shaped and formed, we formalize this into the institution of marriage. So let's, today let's focus on God looked at all of creation and saw that there was no partner for the man. And then God created a helper out of the man. <clears throat> and before we think of helper as a subordinate, remember in the Psalms, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Psalms 115, and my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth, which is Psalms 121. And we know from our own lives that helpers can either be higher or lower or the same status in, in society. God made this helper as a partner. And the two work together and they balance each other. From the very beginning, human beings need relationship and they need community to survive. We need each other to thrive. So some Pharisees come to Jesus, not to get his thoughts on marriage and relationship, but to trip him up. Maybe they're thinking of John the Baptist who lost his head over challenging the marriage of Herod and Herodias. 
It seemed like a really good topic to put Jesus on the spot. And the question they ask is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? But Jesus, he doesn't play their game and focus on what does the law allow. He's not interested in reinforcing societal rules about what is allowed and what is not. Jesus responds speaking of relationship. He speaks in a way that both addresses the relationship of a man and his wife and that the breaking of relationship, we know the breaking of relationship is at best incredibly painful. But it also, he offers protection for society's most vulnerable, which had a lot to do with relation, you know, with, with marriage has a lot to do both with our, um, with how we feel and how we care and also where we are in society and very, uh, the very possibility of survival and it was a lot more then than now when women weren't working outside of the home other to support the family business. So we have acknowledging that breaking of relationship is difficult and I think we can all agree on that one. But then he goes to the little children and protecting those who are most vulnerable. So last week on our way home from Glacier National Park, we went through the western part of Montana and went to the Minidoka internment camp. That was set up to hold the Japanese Americans during World War II. And you know, I wanted to share this because it has to do with the vulnerable of society. And it's a little bit removed from us, and in a way it's not. It's one of those things that we know about and is taught in Washington history. It wasn't taught when I was a kid in California, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> but to see it kind of brings it home. And the Japanese Americans that, that went there, or some of them were first generation immigrants, but others were born here. They were citizens, or as how they were described in the language of the day, they were aliens and non-aliens. Non-aliens. So many of the 13,000 interned there were taken from the Seattle region, and or a lot of them from Bremerton, and they were put into buses and taken to the Puyallup Fairgrounds. And there they were assigned a number and that number would follow them the rest of their time that they would be interned in the camp. They had their names taken away and they would struggle with the loss of identity, the loss of their place in society. Like many in our current prison system, people are no longer a name, they're a number. But in the camps, these people still work to try and maintain some sense of community. But for the rest of the people on the West Coast, they disappeared into a lost world. And sadly, when the war was over and they did return, they were more often than not, not welcome back into the communities they've been pulled out of. They had no name, no place to live, not welcomed. In other words, no community. It wasn't a good moment in the history of our country. And we've been trying to make amends for this bad behavior in the shameful series of actions since 1980. This time in our own history, it serves to remind us that what may be considered lawful at the time can also tear down who we are as humans. We always need to remember that. That just because it's lawful doesn't necessarily mean it's good, especially for the vulnerable. Now our gospel text reminds us of the importance of community and how it is made evident in the world as viewed by children. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them rebuked. We've talked about that word rebuked before. 
They rebuked them, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He was angry, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Amen. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. I suspect we need more blessing of each other in our lives. And here, after Jesus shared with them why the breaking of relationship and community is such a bad thing and goes against what God originally intended and the ideal plan of life for all creation, the disciples are again missing the point. Jesus is showing and demonstrating what it is to build community and how all are welcomed into this new reality, which is the kingdom of God. Jesus, as he works with the disciples, is continually bringing children into the midst of them because children have something to teach us about friendship. There was a child's fourth birthday party several years ago, and a lot of children were playing together. And when one child fell down or feelings were hurt, the slight never lasted than about five seconds, and there was suddenly something new to do. And if there was a little more serious, a parent was ready to offer a word of comfort or solace or a hug if needed. And soon the child would be back in the mix with the other children. Children see the world differently. In that they can look for fun and things that adults sometimes pass by without giving it a second thought. The child's mind can be a fertile ground that sees things not as they are, but rather what can be. Possibilities seem endless. And the flight of imagination and fantasy is possible. Our most vulnerable are also our most curious and quick to move on and to get another hug from another person. <laughs> Someone you love or a good friend is that person who, when you are in their presence, time seems to stand still. And whatever you're doing, whether it's visiting or reading or watching a movie or listening to music, the activity can take over and you're caught up in something new. And the result is that you leave the encounter changed and with new potential. And children are like that in their friendships. They see new things and are open to losing a part of themselves in an effort to try something new. And as adults, though, we don't want to give up control or domination of the world that we have built. After all, I'm in charge, right? No, not really. God, creator, sustainer of all that is and ever will be, is the one who is in charge. God is that parent who is there to reassure us of the love that God has for us as only God can. Though we're reminded as we read about male and female marriage and divorce today that we all fall short of being the ideal human. Jesus reminds us that it is God who gives life and love and restores and sustains us in our lives and relationships. So be the child. Know that you are embraced by Jesus Christ himself. Amen. <laughs>